Today we're talking about rosacea and this is something that I get asked about a lot and I don't know if I'm imagining it or maybe you can shed some light rose. Do you think we're seeing more rosacea or do you think it is just because we're more aware of it? I'm definitely seeing more rosacea in the clinic. Yes, um, it's one of the most common conditions that I treat in clinic and one of the conditions that I really love to treat as well. Mm. Yeah, I think we're seeing more of it too. And I might wonder if it's just because we're more aware of rosacea now and we know more about it or if more people are actually presenting with rosacea. But it seems to me that I'm seeing more people with rosacea and I'm just, I don't know if I'm going mad here or if I'm imagining it, but everyone seems to be saying to me, a lot of skin therapists anyway say a lot of their clients have rosacea. And so why not, let's get talking about this today and discuss what it is and what we can do to help manage it because it can be a real issue for a lot of people and there is quite a few little tips we can do at home to help manage it. First of all, though, I think it's important to clarify that if you think you've got rosacea, it's really important to get a diagnosis from a dermatologist to make sure that it is actually rosacea because there are a lot of conditions that could look like rosacea that aren't rosacea. And I think we've mentioned this before, but, um, you know, the correct diagnosis is really important because something that can look like rosacea could be an underlying autoimmune condition. It could be something like lupus. There are cortisol issues like Cushing's that can present like rosacea and even certain vitamin deficiencies, you know, severe riboflavin deficiency could look similar to rosacea. So first of all, make sure it is rosacea and as skin professionals, we can't treat rosacea, but we can help to manage it by, you know, lifestyle factors and also with topical and professional treatments, right? Yes, um, that is correct. It is such a complex condition. Um, Generally, clients that experience rosacea will know if they generally have some sort of um, inflammation within their skin. They'll they'll understand that there's something that's present all the time within their skin. Um, But like I said, it's very complex. It's very different for each and every uh, individual client. Their triggers are different. Um, It can show up so randomly. However, you can have a genetic predisposition to it. It is so connected to our immunity, to our gut health, to our lifestyle, our diet, our stress levels, uh, medical history. There is such a a complex um, array of, I guess, indications for rosacea uh, and the causes of rosacea, I should say. Mm, And I think recently it sort of seems to be more of a link to an abnormal functioning of the immune system and that can result in um, this vasodilation, so reddening, particularly around the cheeks and the chin, um, more inflammation in the skin and this development of atypical superficial blood vessels, which can worsen over time if it's not managed. So there are varying degrees of rosacea and it can start with just sort of redness of the cheeks and flushing and then it can develop and it can develop if left unmanaged um, to quite disfiguring sort of um, facial features and that's when you have to have potentially more invasive treatments to help to manage that and get sort of a real sort of deformity of the nose, et cetera. So management is really important at an early stage and diagnosis most importantly is key so we know how to manage it. Yes, management is the key word here. Really, once you are diagnosed with rosacea, um, it generally tends to be an underlying condition that can show up according to whatever your triggers are. So learning to understand your triggers and what really sets it off. But the best way to manage rosacea is really looking at this as an as a holistic or integrative approach and treating the person as a whole. If left untreated and not managed, it can really escalate as the client gets older. Um, there are different grades of rosacea. Like you said, that can end up, you know, in the eyes, it can end up with a deformity in the nose. Um, so, you know, which will then need surgical intervention, but if you can manage the condition and, and make those changes into a client's lifestyle, you can really get the condition under control. And I'm a big believer, as you already know, that the skin never lies and it 
it's always talking to us. And I do think, you know, when we are seeing rosacea flare-ups, there's usually something else that's going on. And this is when it really, we really need to start to dig deep and become that detective and start to ask about lifestyle factors, start to ask about diet, all of those things, because that can actually really play a huge role in managing those flare-ups. And I think even stress, people don't realize how much stress can affect things like your gut health and also the inflammatory response in the skin. So if you're under a huge amount of stress, that could even trigger a rosacea flare-up. And I know myself, when I'm stressed, my skin reacts more to skincare. So sometimes I can be using a skincare product, absolutely fine, no problem. And then all of a sudden I use it and I have a flare up and it's because I'm stressed and my skin's just a little bit more reactive than normal. So these are just really basic things that we need to look at um, to understand really what's going on. I don't think people realize either that there is a link between rosacea and disease risk factors as well. And there has been a link between an increased risk of things such as cardiovascular disease and rosacea. Also things like rheumatoid arthritis, which again involves the immune system and even things like dementia. So getting the immune system and the inflammatory response managed is quite important. There also seems to be a link between insulin resistance and rosacea as well. And I'm a big believer in when we're looking at any kind of inflammatory skin condition, we really need to be looking at blood glucose regulations. So insulin resistance with acne as well is really important. Um, Same when we're managing rosacea, making sure that blood sugar is well managed um, because there does seem to be that link. And there is also a link with fatty liver disease and rosacea. So I'm not saying if you've got rosacea, you've got all of these things, but there does seem to be a link with them. And if somebody is coming in or presenting with rosacea as a nutritionist or nutritional medicine practitioner, what I would be doing is testing gut health also looking at liver function as well, because fatty liver can be linked to rosacea. So if I'm seeing a flare up on the cheeks, for instance, I want to be looking at liver health as well, because that's the liver and the gut quite often are involved whenever we start to see these inflammatory skin type of conditions on the skin. Definitely. Um, I've seen a connection uh, between rosacea and clients that have SIBO. I have seen clients that have rosacea and gastrointestinal issues that they have seen come up post Roaccutane. Um, I've seen rosacea show up on clients with endometriosis, menopause. There is a real connection to so many things, but bottom line, it comes down to inflammation um, and very much connected to our immune response as well. Mm. And with SIBO, which is a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, there seems to be a high incidence of people with SIBO and rosacea. So that's always worth getting checked. And you can actually check that, um, you know, with a, a naturopath or a nutritionist. With SIBO, you've got to work out what's going on in the gut and what's actually causing that imbalance. Also, there seems to be a high incidence of H. pylori infection in the stomach And H. pylori is a pathogenic bacteria that we don't want. So that's an easy test with the GP. They can just do a breath test for H. pylori. If someone has got H. pylori, then that does need to be treated with quite strong antibiotics to get that under control. But it's worth ruling out and getting that checked because H. pylori can lead to um, worsening of things like stomach ulcers and even potentially um, stomach cancer and things like that if left untreated long term. So that's what I'm saying. We always, whenever the skin is telling us something, we always need to sort of get that further checked out to rule out any underlying more sort of serious conditions. So there is that gut um, link. And sometimes it may just be something like a dysbiosis in the gut. So when the gut bacteria is, or the gut microbiome is out of whack and that might simply be through stress it might be through medications it might be through diet but what is interesting rose is if you look at things like insulin resistance 
fatty liver, inflammatory skin conditions, cardiovascular, that can all be linked back to diet. And when I say diet, it's really important here. I'm talking about lifestyle and diet and what we do every day continuously. I'm not talking about don't ever have an ice cream or don't ever have a bowl of pasta or, you know, I'm not talking about scaremongering on food. I'm talking about your overall diet as a whole. And we do know that, you know, fatty liver and blood sugar dysregulation, if you are living on a diet that is high GI, so you're having a lot of refined carbohydrate, um, you're not getting enough fiber, you're not getting enough prebiotics, you're not getting enough plant food, and you're literally living off ultra processed foods, high refined carbohydrates, and saturated fat, that is not going to have a beneficial result on your long term health and well being that will affect gut health that that can affect your blood sugar. And so I would always be looking at the diet in that regard diet overall, you know, what is it looking like? The most important thing here is not to scare people because I find if somebody has got a skin condition, whether it's rosacea, whether it's acne, if you say, you know, I'll be careful of the high GI foods and suddenly they get frightened and they'll never eat another donut or they'll never have another, you know, bowl of pasta and they get really scared. And it, it's not about scaring people on food. It's about getting the foundation of a healthy diet, right? Then they can have a little bit of everything. Um, it's not about never having a glass of wine, but if you're having two or three glasses of wine every night and you've got rosacea and you've got fatty liver disease and you've got blood glucose issues and insulin resistance, you're just going to make the problem worse. You're not helping the problem. So it's about finding the balance and getting the foundations right, which is so important. And that's the truth. Um, and consistency is key. And this is a conversation that I have with my clients on a regular basis during the consultation when they are presenting with rosacea. Consistency is key. So adapting a lifestyle that does involve a diet that's based more on whole foods, your fresh fruit, your veggies, good fats, good protein, good carbohydrates, you're then reducing quite significantly significantly those inflammatory based foods which is your sugar refined processed junk food alcohol it doesn't mean you can never do that again but what you're trying to create is consistency it's a lifestyle change to reduce that inflammatory response that is associated with rosacea um, and rebuilding that inner health reducing that inflammatory response from an internal perspective um, according to whatever the the trigger is for that particular client so it's addressing everything that's in that client's lifestyle that will trigger the inflammatory response with rosacea so so diet is huge you know alcohol i generally to find one of the biggest triggers with rosacea um, high sugar refined foods it really does drive that inflammation when you're trying to manage this condition in clinic um and really getting those or providing those treatments for clients that create change and rebuild the skin if they're not following through with consistency in their diet um, and lifestyle it will basically um i guess delay the results in, in in achieving some sort of management with the condition so yes it doesn't mean you can never have an ice cream again or you can never have an alcoholic drink again it's picking your times and being as consistent as you can with a lifestyle that helps to address rosacea triggers mm, it's something i see all the time and you know i was at an event the other day and the poor girl had acne and she was told you know stay off gluten and dairy and that's a whole other topic of debate and it, it kind of infuriates me when people are saying don't eat this don't eat that because they get scared of these foods and so what she was picking out was all the um, gluten-free options which were refined carbohydrate and then sushi which we know sushi rice is full of glucose syrup right so not great for acne. She would have been better off having the whole grains and some healthy dairy to be quite honest with you but picking things that she thought was healthy and was absolutely paranoid about it and wasn't doing her skin any favours. So sometimes a little bit of nutritional information can be dangerous and people can end up doing more harm than good. As I said, you know, a high GI diet overall isn't great, but um, it doesn't mean to say you can't ever have sugar again. We've just got to put everything into, into balance. And the other thing with rosacea as well, we know that alcohol can cause flare-ups with rosacea, absolutely. So if you're doing all these treatments and you're you're using the right products and your diet's great, but then you're drinking alcohol every night, 
you're sort of, you know, I say it's like going to the gym and running on the treadmill but eating a donut at the same time. It's sort of you're sort of fighting a, a losing battle. It's very hard to treat something when you're sort of putting more fuel on the fire, if you like. So it's about understanding what right. those triggers are. When it comes to alcohol, it it affects the gut, it affects the skin, and too much of that will definitely trigger a rosacea flare-up. We also know gut health can play a huge role, as we've mentioned. So I'm a big believer in, you know, eating for a healthy gut, which is eating that diversity of, of plant foods, getting in the prebiotics, which are the fuel for your beneficial microbes. What people tend to do is go, right, I'm going to be really healthy. And quite often they can then worsen their rosacea. So they'll start with either a green tea or a matcha in the morning. Then they may have sort of the gluten-free options, which are more refined carbohydrates, which isn't great either. They may be going then for things like avocado and tomato on toast, they're high histamine, the match is high histamine. That can then cause more of a rosacea response because these are all sort of creating a histamine response in the skin. They're then having their tuna and avocado for lunch, tin tuna. Um, they're then having fermented foods because they read they were good, which again can be aggravating for rosacea because of the histamine response. They're then taking probiotics, which can also be problematic. And then they've been told all this stuff is healthy and now they're finding that their rosacea is flaring up. So it is <laughs> it is really confusing. And I think not only is it about getting a balanced, healthy diet, it's understanding that certain foods can trigger rosacea, but don't be scared of those foods. It's the amount that you're having of them. And it's about if you're having a rosacea flare up, maybe go easy on the foods that are histamine releasing because that might be worsening the rosacea flare up so talking about that we probably should talk about what we mean by histamine foods and histamine releasing because with rosacea we know we know that we want to have a healthy well-balanced diet sort of minimize the alcohol minimize the high refined carbohydrate type diets carbs are good but not they're just sort of the refined sugar etc if that is the majority of your diet but Again, we need to be aware of things that could trigger a rosacea flare-up. And they tend to be things such as alcohol, we know, but also things that are high histamine or histamine liberating because what that does, it creates more of an inflammatory response on the skin. Yes. And because in a rosacea skin, we've already got an increased inflammatory response Sometimes when we have too many histamine foods in the diet, that can trigger a response. Histamine can also be affected by fluctuating estrogen levels as well. So that, you know, hormones, um, premenstrual, also around the menopause, that can all cause fluctuations in the hormones. We know that when estrogen goes high and it can fluctuate, obviously, perimenopause, just before the menopause, estrogen can soar, that can affect the skin, that can reduce enzymes that clear histamine. Um, and so again, we can see more sensitivity and more inflammation in the skin. So high histamine foods tend to be all the healthy ones. And I again want to make this very clear. I'm not saying do not eat healthy food. I'm saying eat healthy food, but it's, think of it like a bucket, you know, you're pouring in the water and eventually you the bucket becomes full and it starts to overflow. Histamine can be a little bit like that. If you're not clearing it effectively in the skin um, or in the body, should I say, then when we have too much, eventually you may have a histamine response. It does depend on gut health. It does depend on your hormones as well. So high histamine foods tend to be things like your aged foods. So aged cheese, you know, like, um, uh, blue cheese, that type of thing, um, fermented foods. So we all hear fermented foods are really good for us, which they are, but too much might be problematic for some people and they may find that they get stomach ache or gut ache or they may get um, inflammation in the skin because of too much too soon with the histamine response. We also know that things like chai tea, green tea, matcha may be problematic for some people 
We know things like citrus fruits, tomatoes, pineapple, that can all create more of a, a histamine response in some people. Again, it depends how much you have. A little bit, you may be absolutely fine. But if your whole diet is high histamine, then you might just need to, to monitor what your intake is and be a little bit more mindful. Alcohol, champagne, wine, they tend to be the worst ones. And that is why, you know, some people say whenever I, I can't myself really have champagne, I can't tolerate it. I get a headache instantly. My cheeks start to burn. Just doesn't do well with me. I can't also tolerate things like green tea. I love green tea, but I can't tolerate it. I can put it on my skin, but I can't drink it. I just don't tolerate it very well. So not all histamine foods are going to be problematic. It may be one or two that you find are particularly triggers for you. And it's about finding out what your triggers are. You don't have to completely avoid those foods, but just minimizing them um, is really important. Things like cinnamon, um, cinnamaldehyde foods, chocolate, chili, spicy foods, they can be problematic for people with rosacea. And again, for some people, they may be able to have chili, no problem, but somebody else may find that they have an issue with tomatoes, for instance, or oranges. Vinegar can also be a problem as well. So vinegar foods, balsamic vinegar might be a trigger for some people, depends how much you have again. So it's about getting the right balance and finding out what those triggers are. And if you're having a rosacea flare up, say, well, I might just want to minimize those for now. And then when it's under control, I can start to have more of those again. And then you'll find your limit again. It's a bit like alcohol intake. You know, I know that two drinks is my max. I'm not a big drinker, but two is my max. Any more than that, I'm not going to feel great. It's a bit like that with the histamine foods. You need to find out what your tolerable level is and make sure that you don't overdose on too much histamine food. Because I do find people tend to overdose on everything. It's like fermented food, the green tea, the avocado, the tuna fish, um, you know, and before you know it, that everything they've got is, is histamine. Cooked chicken. So if you have it fresh, it's fine. But if you have day-old chicken in your salad with avocado, with tomatoes, with a balsamic dressing, for a rosacea skin, that might be too much. Yeah, and it does come back back to understanding your own personal triggers. So it is, like I said before, such a complex condition and it's different for every single client. But when you take on board this really valuable information and how you can adapt your diet and the foods that you eat to help to reduce that inflammatory response, this is when you start to get better results in clinic with your procedures. It's not counterproductive. Um, you start to manage the condition a lot better and it impacts their daily life as well because rosacea can be quite a debilitating skin condition. Um, it can really upset clients quite significantly. So taking on board the fact that, yes, we do need to adjust our diet. We do need to think about what we're eating, really reducing any inflammatory foods that trigger off that rosacea response is vital to achieving some sort of resolution with this condition. So, yeah, that that's really good advice. Um, I find sun exposure to be another trigger for rosacea. So it, for clients that are spending a lot of time in the sun, not protected from the sun, um, it can really exacerbate the inflammation in the skin um, with rosacea. It's the biggest trigger, I think. Um, stress, sun, alcohol, they, I would say, are the, the three main triggers. And with sun, um, the exposure to sunlight will trigger rosacea and even heat can trigger the rosacea. Yeah. What's interesting with rosacea skin, it does seem to have an increase in, so on the skin, we've got the microbiome, which are little microorganisms. We've also got things like antimicrobial peptides. We've got those in the gut as well. And these microbes and antimicrobial peptides are all working together in harmony, keeping watch, if you like, fighting off pathogens and, and anything that's going to cause harm. In a rosacea skin, these antimicrobial peptides, which really are there to protect us and they're, they're meant to be there, they seem to be upregulated or increased. So usually the antimicrobial peptides will increase when there's a, a pathogen, if you like, to, to protect us. But they're permanently upregulated in a rosacea skin. And there's all different types of antimicrobial peptides. And there's a particular one 
that I can never pronounce properly called cathelicidin or something like that, um, which tends to be in higher amounts in rosaceous skin. What is interesting, um, it's, it could be to do with the link that there may be in a rosaceous skin an increase in the demodite, demodex mite. So that's yes. like a little mite that we all have. But in rosaceous skin, it tends to be an increase in there. And that mite produces a protein in the skin. And that protein is what seems to be... Um, what causes the inflammation, which further then upregulates this antimicrobial peptide in the skin, which then causes further vasodilation and inflammation. Exposure to sunlight, because the skin wants to protect itself from the UV rays, also will upregulate this antimicrobial peptide that is already high in a rosaceous skin. So any exposure to heat and sunlight, particularly UV rays in a rosaceous skin, will upregulate this already upregulated antimicrobial peptide, causing further vasodilation and, and inflammation. So staying out of the sun is really important, direct exposure to the skin. Um, we need to wear the SPF and we need to have you know, a hat to protect, but just do not put your face in direct UV exposure because it will worsen with rosaceous skin. The other really interesting thing is some people with rosacea have been found to have higher levels, higher blood serum levels of vitamin D. Not sure why. I'm not sure if that's because they've been supplementing or if it's some genetic thing. Not everybody does. So it is interesting. So it is worth getting vitamin D levels checked because during the winter people can supplement with vitamin D, which is often advisable because we get low in vitamin D and it's needed for our immune system. However, there is a link. Some people may have higher vitamin D levels with rosacea. We also know some people may have more of the stemodex mite. Some people may have more of the antimicrobial peptides, but vitamin D we know is important for our immune system, particularly our immune skin health. And that's because vitamin D upregulates the same antimicrobial peptides for immune function in the skin. But if it's already high in a rosaceous skin, if someone then is taking vitamin D supplements, it could be worsening the problem in a rosaceous skin. So again, I'm not saying do not take a supplement if it's been prescribed for you, but it may be contributing in a rosaceous skin. We just need to do a bit more investigation um, and to check, do you need the supplement? Have you had your levels checked? If you do, then you need to keep taking it. If you don't, do you need to be taking the supplement? Is it making your rosacea worse? Because some supplements can cause rosacea flare-ups. Um, certain medications can do it, like blood pressure medications. Speak to your doctor if you if, do not stop taking any medication. Let's make that clear. But it may be worsening rosacea. We also know that certain B vitamins may cause rosacea flare-ups because of the vasodilation, particular things like niacin, for instance. So again, is that causing a problem? So one of the things I would always ask somebody, Rose, is are you taking any supplements? Because we need to find out maybe has the rosacea flared up since you've been taking that supplement, even probiotics. Probiotics, some bacteria or some um, probiotics can be hip, uh, histamine liberating. So we have gut flora. They can produce histamine. So if your gut's out of whack, we may have an overproduction of, of histamine. Um, that's a whole other topic and it's quite complicated. But if you are taking probiotics, some can produce more histamine. If you're not clearing it, that may be causing a rosacea flare. So if they're taking a multivitamin with B vitamins. They're also taking vitamin D. They're also taking probiotics. They're also taking, you know, fermented foods. They're also having their matcha tea and tin tuna and avocado and all of these things. Maybe they're taking apple cider vinegar and lemon juice in water because they heard that was good for them. These are all things that are adding up, you know, they're stacking up and eventually that could cause a flare up. And this is why we need to be detectors and start to find out, well, it could be this and it could be that. Let's try this. Let's try that and, and tweak to find out um, 
what the trigger is and what we can pull back and what we can increase to get that happy balance. Yes, and it comes down to gut function, obviously. You know, whatever we put into our bodies is going to determine how our gut functions, how our flora actually functions, how our genes are expressed. So, you know, uh, even clients that I find don't have regular bowel movements, their rosacea can flare up as well. If they're not drinking enough water, too much coffee, um, those typical, you know, triggers can also impact the way that the skin behaves quite significantly. So lifestyle is key. Consistency is key with this condition and it has to be handled holistically. There's no one cream. There's no one treatment. Um, you have to have the diversity in, in a holistic approach in, in managing this condition. It, it's really important. Yeah, for sure. And I'm always looking at supporting the gut health and supporting the liver health as well. When we're looking at a rosacea skin, any inflammatory skin, um, that is always important because otherwise, you know, we need to get that inflammation under control. And a lot of people don't realize systemic inflammation quite often stems from an imbalance in the gut. Yes, yes, correct. That That's exactly right. Um, get a little bit further into dairy and rosacea. I know there's a lot of... Um, therapists and and everyone kind of connecting you know dairy to rosacea and inflammation you know obviously too much of one thing is not good for us however dairy doesn't always necessarily trigger off rosacea either do you feel like it's the sugar in dairy is it the lactose or a protein in dairy that people are really re reacting to or do you feel like it's just dairy in general should we should we really be having non-dairy alternatives when it comes to milk Get some clarity around this. When it comes to dairy and rosacea, it's not something that I would automatically look at. Um, I think dairy often gets a, a bad rap for no reason. There are a lot of people that are lactose intolerant um, and that's because they can't process the sugars in the dairy and then they can get side effects such as, you know, diarrhea or gas or whatever that may be. There are lactose-free dairy alternatives, but that doesn't really correlate to rosacea. That's something different. Um, is dairy inflammatory? Unless you've got a sort of a, an allergy or an intolerance, not really. Um, I think it comes down to really how you respond to dairy. I think it does get a bad rap. You know, quite often dairy has got people cut dairy out and they will swap to a plant milk that's really high GI, that's got plant oils and sugars in, which in my opinion is going to be way worse for rosacea than just simply taking out dairy. I would never just take somebody off dairy without getting um, testing and without getting the foundations of a healthy diet right because, um, you know, usually they can tolerate a little bit of dairy if they have the foundation of the diet right and dairy has got so many important nutrients in that I think sometimes it gets a bad rap. There's unhealthy dairy and there's healthy dairy, so let's be clear with that. You can have ultra-processed yogurts full of sugar, not particularly healthy dairy. You can have these saturated fat ultra-processed cheese that really doesn't look like cheese at all it's so processed and these string like things that are you know what is it it looks like plastic so there's dairy and there's dairy yeah um if if you're eating you know pizza with cheese and refined carbohydrate that's not that's not healthy food now and again it's absolutely fine but if that's your main diet that's going to be pro-inflammatory if you're having goat's cheese, if you're having natural yogurt, you're having a whole food healthy diet, that's a really part of a healthy diet. So it's not something I would strip out straight away with a rosacea skin. Um, even with acne, there's a little bit of evidence that in some people with acne, milk may be a problem, but it's not the first thing that I would remove. It depends how much they're having as to whether it's causing a problem. It doesn't mean to say everyone with acne needs to take away dairy. Same thing with rosacea. Why do they need to take take away the dairy with rosacea? We, we've got to do a bit more digging before we just start taking people off major food groups because quite often the things they swap out to are actually more pro-inflammatory and that's what people don't realise. And it just comes back to understanding your own personal triggers. And I ask clients a lot of these questions in the consult, you know, where do you feel your skin changes the most? 
with regard to the foods that you're eating are you lactose or intolerant generally you know does gluten affect you um does your gut become you know bloated do you have cramping do you have pain when you eat these foods if so then that's also going to trigger off the inflammatory response in your skin and drive rosacea so it is about digging it is about asking the right questions and from a client's point of view understanding their own personal triggers when they see their rosacea at its worst, what's happened the day before or the night before? What have they eaten and what have they had when they wake up the next morning and say, oh my God, my rosacea is out of control today. Um, and diagnosis, once again, um, is very important because acne and rosacea can often be misdiagnosed as well. So understanding the client's skin and diagnosing it correctly um, is very, very important when you're trying to get a resolution with their skin health. For sure. Look, I do think dairy and gluten get a bad rap and quite often people sort of are scared of it and not really understanding. Like I was saying with skincare ingredients, um, you know, formula is king. It's the formula overall that is most important, not the individual ingredients. The same goes with food. You know, with, with gluten, people just hone in on the gluten, but they're not looking at the whole food and what else that gluten is with so is it just with sugar and saturated fat and refined carbohydrate then it's not really going to provide any nutritional value and it's probably going to be more pro-inflammatory if that is predominantly what your diet is made of but if the gluten is with whole grains and polyphenols and vitamins and minerals and fiber it's not really going to be an issue and studies have actually shown that um i think it was the polyphenols will actually reduce your zonulin levels um Gluten, we know, increases zonulin, which can be contributed to leaky gut. And then everyone's like, oh, gluten causes leaky gut. But you don't eat gluten on its own. You eat it with other food, right? So we know that polyphenols will reduce zonulin levels. So therefore, it's not going to be an issue for leaky gut if you have it in its right form. If you just ate gluten on its own, it might be an issue. So we sort of hone in on one area without looking at the big picture, like when people look at a nutritional supplement, um, it's like the the Vitasol Omegas. It drives me nuts when people go, oh, you know, they just look at the Omega content, which um, they don't look at the other ingredients and what they're doing and the anti-inflammatory and antioxidant. But, you know, you've got to look at the formula. The formula is king. And the same goes with nutritional supplements, with skincare products and with food. You know, that it's the whole meal or it's a whole nutrient content in the food. And as you know, I'm passionate about nutrigenomics, which is looking at, you know, it's not about necessarily the vitamin percentage content in a food. It's the combination of the prebiotics, the polyphenols, the phytonutrients, and how they work on a biochemical level is way more powerful than looking at one individual nutrient. And so this outdated approach, in my opinion, of just looking at an isolated ingredient it's quite an ignorant way of looking at things. We The body is way more complex and we know it's what we do to our bodies every day that has the biggest impact over time. It's not about, oh my God, you ate a donut, that's going to give you acne. It doesn't work like that. If you have a healthy diet overall, you can have a donut. You know, It's not going to be a problem. It's if you just eat gluten completely in its natural state as gluten with nothing else yeah that might be problematic but if you eat it as part of a whole food diet it's fine in fact i think studies actually showed that people that are on a gluten-free diet have a higher incidence or higher risk of cardiovascular di disease and diabetes type 2 diabetes um because it's high refined carbohydrate you know so yeah. A little bit of information can be really dangerous. And I think this is where as professionals, we need to be careful what we say to clients. You know, a skin professional, if you are not a nutritionist, has no right to say to a client, cut dairy, cut gluten out of the diet because they do not understand. You know, they've got caught up in this whole social media bandwagon of this is good, this is bad. We're not looking at the bigger picture and we're just honing in on one ingredient and the body is way more complex than that. I'm so glad you said that because it always comes back down to our own duty of care within our own scope of practice. We understand as professionals, yes, we need to do this on a holistic approach. However, when, when it comes to giving advice on diet, 
you can get gain an understanding from clients as to what their triggers are associated with food, but referring and collaborating with a nutritionist that can really do some proper testing and really fine tune the foods that they are to eat and not to eat to support your treatment plan is so important. Um, and this is what I also explained to my staff as well. We are not nutritionists. We need to stay within our scope of practice. We do have a we do have an understanding of what the typical triggers are associated with rosacea when it comes to diet, and we can advise clients what to avoid because, you know, from an inflammatory point of view, we want to reduce inflammation. But to really delve in further and find out exactly from a dietary point of view how their gut is behaving with certain foods, which does drive the inflammation, you need to collaborate with another professional. And I'm so. I guess, passionate about staying credible within the industry. And I think this is something that I hope a lot of therapists take on board because it just makes us look more professional, more credible. And at the end of the day, it is about patient outcome. It is always about the client and providing the best advice that we possibly can, um, looking at the bigger picture, like you said, and really pointing to them in the right direction where they need to go to connect the dots to manage this condition in the best way possible. It is so complex and individual for every person. It really is. And I think on social media, everybody is an expert, you know, and sometimes I I try and stay off it a bit more now because everybody is preaching and telling you what you should be doing and what you shouldn't be doing. I, 90% of the time it's incorrect information and it just drives me insane. And I'm just like, oh, Probably the people with all the right information aren't on social media. There are some that do have good information, but it's a minefield out there and it's it's getting quite a dangerous place because people do want answers and they will try anything and sometimes that can make it dangerous. So I think the takeaway from today, Rose, is really, first of all, seek medical diagnosis. If you think you've got rosacea, um, seek a dermatologist to rule out any underlying health conditions and make sure what you're sort of looking at is actually rosacea and then start to look at recognizing what your rosacea triggers are. So for some people, it might be when they go out in the sun, others, it might be stress, others, it might be certain foods that are triggers, you know, every time you have champagne or, or alcohol, avoid extremes of temperature um, then certain skin products might be problematic as well. And I know we're going to talk about that in the next episode. Then it might be seeing a nutritionist or dietitian for dietary protocols because you also want to rule out any gut issues as well, getting checked for things like SIBO or H. pylori, and then also looking at the diet overall. So is it a diet that is um, a pro-inflammatory diet and can anything be done there to help to balance that out and making sure that you are getting enough of the good foods in like the whole grains, legumes, vegetables, nuts, seeds, all of that diversity that is going to support an anti-inflammatory style diet. We may then look at supplements. So first of all, are your supplements aggravating the rosacea or are there supplements that may benefit? And for me, you know, I'd always be looking at things like the, the liver and gut support. The omegas can be beneficial for most people as well. Get the right quality ones though, because that's really important. And then, um, you know, that's when we can start to have a look at professional skin treatments and we'll be looking at those in the next episode of what you recommend for that as well. I'm so looking forward to that. 